Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Beverly Malden. I am the pastor of Gold Hill United Methodist Church in Gold Hill, North Carolina. If you are visiting with us this morning for the first time, would you please um, let us know where you're from and how we can best pray for you. Jesus said that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, that he is there also. And that also includes gathering via the World Wide Web. So even though we are separate, we are together with the Holy Spirit in the holy presence of Jesus Christ. We have a prayer box in our front lawn, and even though the church has been closed, the prayer box has remained open, and um, we got about five prayers out of it uh, yesterday. And some of those prayers were um, very sweet. I want to share some of those with you so when we go into our prayer time, you can, can remember these people. Of course, they're all anonymous. Uh, one person wants us to pray for all to know the joy and to have joy and to live with Jesus. And one is just thanking God for uh, another day and ask us to pray for his wife. And we also have a very um, serious prayer. All prayer requests are serious, but um, this prayer request, if you would please hold it special and with a lot of tenderness and remember this person throughout the week. Um, they said, Dear Lord, today was the first time that I had <clears throat> thoughts about suicide. Um, so we need to lift this person if you are listening to us this morning, I ask you please get in touch with me or find someone that you can trust. Let us help you and pray you through this hard time. We also have requests to pray for our country, the health care and essential workers, and want us to know how much they appreciate them. And we have someone that is needing some peace in their heart. And I think we all can relate to um, most all of those prayer requests. We will put these prayer cards in this box that we keep on our altar with all previous prayer cards. And all of these prayer cards will go back in, to this box so that we can pray over them every week. Um, and if you ever have need of prayer, just uh, send us a, a prayer private message on this page that you're watching, or if you are ever here in the village, uh, take use of our prayer stand that is in our front yard, and people will immediately start praying for you and your needs. As always, we remember our shut-ins, Archie and Gail and Glenna and Shirley. Um, <clears throat> we lift up all of those that are suffering from this virus of course, um, and other diseases. We have several members at our church that are currently going through chemo. If you would please keep them lifted um, in, in your prayer time throughout the week. Um, Gold Hill, we are a special little church uh, here out in the country. We are a community of people loving God and loving his people and loving the world around us. And we welcome you to worship with us. Would you join me now in prayer? Dear loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather again separately but together because we know that you are with us. We know that wherever two hearts are joined in your name, you are there and the winds of the Holy Spirit is blowing. We lift up your holy name, O Lord. If we could, we would be singing the hallelujah chorus. If we could gather together, we would be in song and unison. But from where we are, from our kitchen table to the living room or out in the yard we lift up your name your holy holy name and we thank you for loving us and for always taking care of us we have so much to be thankful for for our homes and our families and friends 
this church, its wonderful history, the people, the saints that have gone before us to leave this beautiful place for us. But Father, we understand this is just a building. We know that it's the hearts that make the church what it is. And we, we, we have learned that over these past few weeks. We thank you for these lessons learned. Um, We thank you for ways that you have drawn us nearer to one another, even, even through this time of separation. We thank you for all the medical teams and nurses and doctors that have not walked away in fear, but they have stood on the front lines. And I, I ask for special, um, protection for them. Uh, some of them are going into battles every day and never knowing what they're going to be going home and taking home to their families. We thank you, Father, for all that have kept this country running, all of our leaders, the plans they've made, the way they're trying to take care of us. We thank you for the farmers and truckers and retail clerks and stores that have done all they can to make sure we still have food on our table and electricity running into our homes. We're so thankful, Lord, that you have given people different gifts so that we don't have to figure it all out ourselves. Um, we, we pray this morning for our president um, that's making so many hard decisions for us. We, we ask, Lord, that you uh, give him great wisdom and give him courage to do what you are guiding him to do, to, to, um, to make the decisions and, and to stay strong when, when so many people are fighting against him. Father, all the leaders, all the clergy, everyone that's having to make hard decisions, I ask you, Father, to give them wisdom and give them guidance. This morning, we lift up our shut-in to you, Archie and Gail and Shirley and Glenna. Archie had to go to the hospital last week, and we thank you that he was able to come home and that he's okay. We lift up to you, Amanda and Eddie, as they are struggling with their health issues. Um, Eddie, Eddie just really needs your healing hand, Lord, and we ask that you prepare Amanda for the surgery that she will be facing um, later on in June. Father, we thank you for loving them and and always taking care of them and and all of their family. Um, We just lay the small family at your feet and ask that you take over and take control and help them to feel your presence. Father, we have other church members that are going through chemo and and very bravely fighting (coughs) cancer. And we ask that you give them courage and, and let them feel the presence of the Holy Spirit um, with, with all that they are doing. Father, for all that are caring for our six family members, um, caretaking is not an easy job. It is not for the faint of heart. And so I ask that you help them to find rest. Um, in, in their duties, and, and I ask that, that you, you help them to feel you and, and to be refreshed by your presence. I lift up my father-in-law along with all the elderly that we know have not been out of their home for six weeks. We ask that you keep them strong and help them <clears throat> to not feel so lonely. I ask you, Father, today to please forgive us when we place anything equal to or above you and your holy will for our life. We are broken and sinful people that are constantly needing the refreshment of your forgiveness. Father God, there are so many that need prayer at this time, including ourselves. And at this moment, we lift our personal petitions up to you now.
most of all, Father, I ask that you keep us all in your will, that you keep all the distractions of the world at bay so that we don't get in the way of your good work. Help us to be the hands and the feet of Christ. Help us to be kinder and gentler people to one another and to show your love in the best way that we can. Thank you, God, for sending us your Son to teach us how to love you and each other. Now, with the confidence of God's people, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I am going to be reading excerpts out of Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 16 through 31. And I'm starting at 22 right now. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious. For as I am walking along, I saw your many altars, and one of them had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. You have been worshiping him without even knowing who he is, and now I wish to tell you about him. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need there is. His purpose in all of this was that the nation should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As one of your own poets says, we are his offspring, and since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's former ignorance about these things, but now he commands everyone everywhere to turn away from idols and to turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man that he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak of the resurrection of a person who had been dead, some laughed, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you this morning and always. I have a question for you. Do you know why churches have these beautiful spires and steeples on them? Well, there's very many reasons for them. Uh, some believe the higher you got, the closer to God you got. But one reason is because the tallest buildings in the community were the buildings that the community valued the most. And for centuries, in most cities, it was the church steeple that was the tallest. 
And hundreds of years ago, before the Yellow Pages, before GPS, steeples helped persons traveling around from town to town or migrating from one side of the country to the other to be able to find a church, to, to know that this is a community I would like to settle in because I see a steeple. Churches were considered the most important building in town, and the high steeple marked its status in that community. Today, when we travel up and down the highways and we come to an exit ramp, I dare you to, to find any church listing on those green information signs at, at those exit ramps. You'll see hotels and restaurants and colleges and universities and ball fields and all kinds of tourist attractions, but you will not find on those big highway signs, I'm talking about the signs that the state put up, not billboards, but on those exit ramp signs, you're not going to find a sign that says churches with an arrow pointed to the right or the left. If Paul were strolling through America today, I believe the statement of the ancient historian who once said of Athens, he said that, not Paul, this <clears throat> historic, the poet, he said it's easier to find a God there than it is to find a man. And I think that that runs true here in the 21st century, and I think Paul would probably find that same problem. Everywhere Paul looked, there were altars and shrines and temples. There was one to Athena, one to Zeus and Ares and Mars and Jupiter and Venus and Mercury and Neptune and Diana. Athens was a veritable forest of idols. <clears throat> and just to be on the safe side, they built a shrine and labeled it an unknown god, just in case they left someone out. The founding of the unknown God goes something like this. Around 600 years before Paul ever traveled down that road to Athens, there had been a terrible plague, and it threatened the whole city. We can kind of relate to that today. And a Cretan poet, Emeditus, came forward with a plan of what to do uh, to stop this plague. He proposed to set loose a flock of black and white sheep all over the city, and wherever a sheep happened to lay down, it was sacrificed to the nearest god that it had laid down beside of. If it laid down near a shrine of no known god at that time, and there were many, it was sacrificed to the unknown god. Today, we would call that plan covering all the bases. As Paul wandered through all of these statues and all of the shrines that had been built to these false gods, he took advantage of the fact that Athens was still the greatest university town in the world at that time. Remember, Paul was a well-educated Greek-speaking Jew. He could hold his own with any scholar or any man of learning that would come before him. <clears throat> and men from all over the nation would come to Athens to stand beside of a god and to seek the learning from great teachers that were in Athens. It was the original Mars Hill University. This is the location where we find Paul this morning giving what I think one of the most important gospel presentations of the time to the men of Athens during his second missionary journey. <clears throat> you might say that Paul had a little hissy fit that day, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. He started out his sermon with what at first glance seemed to be a genuine compliment for the people of Athens and the men that were standing beside the gods. He says, I see you're deeply religious in just every way. And, and I see that you have many, many objects of worship. While I even found one with the inscription to an unknown God. <clears throat> so naturally, the guys thought that as they stood around the shrines and these objects of worship, they were thinking, he respects us, and he's super educated, and this is going to be a great afternoon. As I was thinking about temples and churches and unknown gods and gods that we do know, I thought about a great idol 
that has been worshipped since mankind got kicked out of the garden. It's the idol of wealth, something of value. And even though <clears throat> that idol has looked different over thousands of years since the creation of the world, it is the same. Gold has always been in competition with God for our affections. Look at downtown Charlotte or Atlanta or New York. Is there any building in Charlotte, North Carolina that is taller than the Bank of America? No, there's not. All of the church steeples sit in the shadows of the bank. What does that say about our priorities today? Remember, remember the most important building was the tallest, and that's why churches had steeples put on them originally? What picture does this paint about where we have been and where we put our hope and our faith? Fred Craddock is a pretty famous Southern preacher, and he tells of an encounter that happened one day in one of his books. He says, I was walking down the streets in Decatur, Georgia, and I was on my way to church where I was going to preach when I met a friend of mine who was sitting at an outdoor coffee shop. And we chatted, and she asked me to sit down and join her, and I told her, no, I had to go to church, but I invited her to come with me. And she held up her Sunday newspaper, and she says, here is my Bible. And then she held up her coffee cup, and she said, and here is my communion. Reverend Craddock goes on to say, I think that the days of that kind of nonsense is ending. I believe that our traditions are going to return with strength, both to the Eucharist and to the carefully crafted sermons that will demand to be published and reread after they are heard. Craddock knew that coffee and the Sunday Times are not sufficient. He also knows that the church has much work to do. And he says the question, Craddock has often said, the question is not whether the church is dying. The question is, is it willing to give its life for the world? Think about that question. Think about the power that is in that question. Paul and so many other believers that have gone before us, they were willing to do just that, to give their life for God, for Jesus, for the world. I, of course, never got to question Reverend Craddock about this statement, but I think that in his writings, he might be challenging the church to turn from your sinful, prideful, lustful, worshiping idols ways and come back to me. This is the message that Paul was giving the men at Mars Hill. This is the message that Jesus was giving to the leaders in the temple as he was turning tables over. You have one God, and none of this is it. Now, an important disclaimer before I go on. I am not talking to one member at Gold Hill United Methodist Church when I say my next statement, because I have not personally witnessed anyone with this particular sin in Gold Hill. But if it applies to anyone else that is listening to me, please take heed. I was a faithful member of a church where some members held the building itself in, in equality to or even higher than God himself, it seemed. I watched families parade out of an 11 o'clock worship service one Sunday morning when the church vote was taken and the announcement came back that the church had voted to build a new sanctuary. There were families that just could not Stand the thought of not worshiping in the church they had grown up in all of their life. So they left the church and they found another one. I have witnessed anger over a minister wanting to remove something from the sanctuary or the pulpit or anywhere that had been given in memory of great-grandma 120 years ago, and that it is doing absolutely nothing today to enhance the service. It is only collecting dust, and sometimes it's cumbersome to work around. 
I have seen churches stuck where they are because a piece of equipment was lovingly donated in memory of the death of someone. But the church has outgrown the need of that piece of equipment, and it needs the space more than it needs the thing. But families are forbid the digging up of and moving that structure maybe 50 yards across the church grounds to make room for church growth. This is idolatry, my friends. When buildings and physical items get in the way of the kingdom, I think that we can all agree that with or without our sweet Gold Hill United Methodist Church building, the word of God lives on and lives strong. We've been doing it for over a month here now, and God, as far as I know, hasn't fallen off of his throne yet. While Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, he spent some time in the temple talking to the Jews and the Greeks and the other leaders and, and worshipped God and, and people that believed in Jesus. But he knew that without his friends, with or without his friends, he had some business to do. He had hearts to convert. He had lives to change. He had some kingdom work that needed to be done. And Paul knew that it's impossible to be a witness to non-believers unless you can engage in that culture and get to know them and for them to get to know you. It's impossible to influence the world if you never leave the church. So Paul left his comfortable conversation that he was having with the church leaders while waiting on his friends and decided that it was time to go. And he went out into the marketplace and he did what I call some slick, smooth, Holy Spirit sales talking. By first appearing to be complimenting them. But then, boom, in verse 23, he starts preaching. So after his fake compliment about, oh, I see you're so religious because you've got all of these statues up, he called them out on the fact that they had so many gods that they ran out of names for them and they built a shrine to an unknown god. Do we have unknown gods in our lives? Well, I know that I do. There's a new acronym that is um, becoming kind of famous in our vocabulary today, FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, the fear of missing out. I realized that recently that I have this fear. I don't know what I'm missing, but I'm sure I'm missing something. I'm missing an event. I'm missing a movie. I'm missing a new gadget. I'm missing something cute that Easton and Ellie Joe are saying or doing. The list goes on and on and on. It was a surprising revelation to me when I realized that that when I realized that and, and I realized the hold that it had on me of not being able to enjoy the moment that I was in for fear of what I was missing out on of wanting to be somewhere else with someone else than rather than where I was right now. I know that that all sounds sick, silly, but it quickly became a part of my prayers. Lord, release from me this FOMO so that I can enjoy the moments that you are giving to me right now. This is an unknown God that I had running around in my head that I was giving way too much time and energy to. So I ask you, what are some of the gods, known and unknown, that you have placed in, in equality or even above our Lord Jesus Christ. Would Paul have a hissy fit if he walked around the streets of your mind? Would Jesus turn the tables upside down in the temple of your heart if he entered them? Would Paul have to start explaining to you, as he did in verse 24 uh, in Athens, there is only one God. And he is not a God made by hand or created in your mind. Paul was preaching the gospel, and it wasn't pretty. The initial response to Paul was pretty negative. In verse 18, they were laughing at him and making fun of him and calling him a babbler. They said, what is he trying to say? And others said, he seems to be telling us about some other gods. Well, he was. He was telling them 
about the one and only God, Jehovah. He was preaching to them about Jesus Christ that had died and rose again for their sins. Suffice it to say that many of these cultural elites were not buying what Paul was selling. Paul would later tell us, the Corinthians, in um, chapter 1, verse 23, that the gospel message is, in fact, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. I think that he was partially referring to that moment at Mars Hill when he said that. On the other hand, and thank goodness, some were impressed. Some were impressed to invite him back for a second hearing. In verse 19, we read, They brought Paul to the Agathias where they said, Please explain to us this new idea that you have been teaching. The things you are saying to us are new, and we want to know what this teaching means. In many ways, I think that this is Paul's finest preaching because he's having to adapt. He is communicating to people that don't share his Bible. They have not read the Torah. They don't understand the power and strength behind the scriptures. These Athenians have never heard the scriptures, and if they did, they probably laughed about what they read or heard. The Bible was not their story. It has no authority for them. So, but, but like the woman at the well, some of these people, they wanted to know more. So they kind of secretly invited him back for an encore performance, I would, I would say. So now Paul's got a handful of people. He's got them hooked. And, and it's time to reel them in, as we would say. But how, how can you do that to people that believe in so many gods that they would even build a shrine and label it? An unknown God. Why name a God an unknown God? Well, I think that it's because maybe they didn't want any God to feel left out. And even though they didn't know that God's name, they wanted to represent them there. I think more likely it was their way of making sure that they didn't offend any God that later in life might take revenge out on them for not putting up a statue or shrine for them. This is the mindset of the people in the marketplace that Paul was trying to help understand that there is only one true God. He had a lot of work to do. He was changing lives. He was converting hearts. He was kingdom building. He's trying to find a way to teach people that don't have the privilege of Scripture that cannot understand the Torah and all that came after, and words that were actually being written in their very lifetime, trying to give them understanding and acceptance of these precious words, these scriptures that are God-breathed words that are going to change their lives and people's lives forever that hear them. So Paul was trying to build a bridge. He was trying to find a starting place to jump off on with his biblical truths. So he starts where they are. Athenians, you guys are very spiritual. I get that. I understand that. I see the statues and the shrines and your spirituality, and I applaud you for that. But as I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found among them one to an unknown God. What you therefore worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And so then Paul starts at the beginning. He starts with the story of creation, and he tells the gospel story, and he shares his witness, and he, he turns over some tables, and he has a little hissy fit in their lives. Is it easy? It, no, it, it usually is not to go into strangers that don't understand what you're talking about and start talking about Jesus Christ. Is it worth it to, to muff a little fe few feathers? It's always worth it. Look in your life. Where are your idols? We all have them. Look in the lives of those that you love. What are the unknown gods? That, that they're holding on to. And how can, can you lovingly help to reframe and restructure the priorities in their lives so that they can understand
that we only have one God. Well, first you do it by letting God lead the way. Let that Holy Spirit blow out the pathway. God is calling us to all let His light shine, not Reverend Beverly Malden's light. I am to let the light of God shine. We are to be His hands and His feet so that we will all hear the true Word of God. We are to love one another the same as He loved us. We are to step out of the temple and to do some kingdom work for a God that is very well known. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's be about some kingdom work this week. Let us pray. Loving Father, we have come to the end of our worship this morning. We pray that you have been glorified this morning with our words and our music and our prayers. Help us to stay in the center of your will so that there are never any unknown gods or idols that are placed equal to or above you. In your Son's holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. Now rejoice, for this is the day that the Lord has made. And this is the good news, that Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ rose, and Jesus Christ is coming back for us again someday.